welcome you to the Economy, Environment and Infrastructure Committee meeting of Tuesday the 14th of June. Can I remind members that the meeting is being recorded and will subsequently be made available to the public for listening purposes. Could we have uh, the President any apologies please? Good morning. We have 16 members present. I have no apologies. Councillor Ian Crothers, Councillor Collins, Councillor Hislop, Councillor McCutcheon and Councillor Nicholl are not present but may be along later in the meeting. Uh, could I give apologies for Councillor Hislop and Councillor Nicholl, please? Thank you. Jim. Yeah, and apologies for Councillor Collins as well. Yeah. Apologies for Ian. Okay, members, do we have any declarations of interest? No, sir. Thanks, Chair. Uh, item number five, sir, paragraph 3.10, there's a reference made to the Wigan Rural Development Company uh, Limited and Newton Stewart. Purely for the record, uh, Chair, uh, I represent the council and the board of that company, uh, but I do not feel the interest as such as to have to leave uh, the meeting. Okay, thanks, Alan, sir. Anyone else? Okay, can we turn then to item number three, which is the minutes of the Economy, Environment and Infrastructure Committee meeting of the 15th of March. Are members happy it's a true record of the meeting? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Item number four, the minute of the House and Subcommittee of the 12th of April. Those members who are on the House and Subcommittee and were in attendance, are you happy that's a true record of the meeting? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, item number five is our annual report now on our one-year funding agreement between the Council and Visit Scotland. Could I ask the Director if there's anything he wishes to add to the report before members? Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, nothing to add to the report, but uh, I, I would like to introduce you to Doug Wilson from uh, Visit Scotland, who is along today to, to assist uh, members with any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to open it up now to any questions or comments from members. Alistair? Uh, Chair, I've, I've, I've no problems with, you know, uh, adopting uh, the recommendations as set out in Section 2 of the report, but, you know, we're getting, getting to the stage where, and it's good coming from a Luddite like me, but uh, when, when you look at the number of people, you know, who are, 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 are booking, you know, online, etc., uh, you know, and, and, and you, you wonder, in fact, if maybe we shouldn't be grasping the nettle uh, and, and sort of dealing with the future of uh, visitor information centres. Uh, rather than sort of spending, well, we're talking about seventy-five thousand uh, pounds, you know, and it's a lot of money, particularly at a time when uh, we're cash strapped. And I think this is an area we've got to focus on in the future, uh, Chair. Uh, and if we are genuinely of the view that we don't, that they don't represent value for money, I think you know we've got to sort of deal with that on, on that basis. You know, I'm not suggesting we do it today. So, uh, as I've said, I have no problems in agreeing the recommendations contained in the report, but uh, maybe maybe we've got to waken up. Realise that you know sort of the world, the world is moving in a different direction. That's a valid point. Asta, we obviously discussed the uh, the review at a previous meeting, so I think that's a very valid point. I don't know. Mark, do you add anything to the comments? Thank you, Chair. Um, the use of social media and the platforms is going to be part of the full report that will be brought back to this committee in November which will deal with the onward strategy for visitor information centres in far more detail, incorporating all of the social media aspects. Thank you. It's just in um, 3.31, um, the autumn and winter campaign and also the spring summer campaign, where you do direct mail shops to, well, in one case, 35,000 homes and in another... 34,000 homes. And I just wonder where you're targeting and who, who, who gets these mail shops and how do you have any idea really if they are going to the right place or is it just a dipping your toe in the water? Um, the, the information we get comes, comes primarily from, from people who are registered to our website. So we, we know that these people who are people who want information, who are looking for information. And we target people across the entire Dumfries and Galloway, so it, it, it's a wide, it's a wide uh, mail shot that goes out to, as you say, thirty-five thousand people across the city. So, so that's just going to people in Dumfries and Galloway. 
and it, it goes to the people wider who have registered and uh, through the visit uh, visitscotland.com website as well have registered an interest or have, have searched for things in the recent galleries so we use quite a few different dynamics to target people outside of the outside of the area as well it just it does it seems quite a lot of money <laughs> and i just you know it's been used if i'm reading this right and we're not getting the booking um getting bookings but we're not getting them like um uh councillor Geddes says through the PICs or the visitor centers but there they are. Um I just wonder if 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 you're how you assess how the, the money you're spending is achieving what we need to get in Dumfries and Gallery, which is visitors who are spending money and coming to spend money. Thank you, Chair for May. In in terms of the actual expenditure for the hard copy mail shots, um it's around about £20,000 that's actually spent on that. And as Doug said, it's generated predominantly through um, what we would call warm leads who have already expressed through the visitscotland.com website interest. But it also is generated through the twice annual marketing interest groups where a number of the tourism sectors and Visit Scotland and the local authority are also part of how that marketing strategy develops. And that looks at the average drive time for visitors to the region. It also looks at things that like um, mountain biking, golf, so that we can target the areas that we know have a specific interest in coming to Dumfries and Galloway, and also within what we already know are drive times that generate that. And that sort of funding there is actually what those activities are generating. So for 20K, it's generating in the region of just over half a million pound return. So that would be part of the marketing going onwards, a, a sort of combination, if you will, of social media and what's called hard collateral to ensure that we're getting to the most people that we can. We do have any other questions from members? Jim? Sorry for my ignorance here, Chair, but the total that we're spending with Visit Scotland is 205,000 a year and according to the figures in 3.31 and 3.32 we're actually uh, gaining over 1.3 million. That looks to me as if for every pound we spend for £6.35 pounds, roughly getting spent in Dumfries and Galloway and that's, that's if you're also including the spending on the visitors information centre which as my colleague says, I wonder if it's actually that part is value for money. But overall, for two hundred and five thousand, we're getting one hundred and three. Eh, sorry, one point three million. Thank you. I, th I think, in terms of, as, as we said earlier, the social media and the visitor information centres um, are going to be part of a full and detailed report that will be brought back in November to this committee for their review. Then. Ian. Thanks. Just to, um, on the back of the discussion about the, uh, the visitor information centres there, I think there might be an argument for, for looking at uh, partnership uh, visitor centres, which will obviously bring footfall into existing businesses. Um, I think the, um, the Newton Stewart one, for example, I think has been more than um, adequate um, and probably beneficial in that, uh, that setting rather than having dedicated uh, buildings. Yeah, it's certainly been effective elsewhere, but the sort of model will be the same. If I may just briefly, Chair, that will also be part of, of the review. Um, Visit Scotland have already been in discussions with the National Trust, um, Freeze, etc., so that we can look at greater integration and, and also partnership working going forward, where we know that there is much higher footfall than we currently get into the VICs. So that will also be part of the report that's brought back in November. Quick follow-up. Uh, um, if you're in touch with, um, what was it, National Trust, um, you might also consider Historic Scotland. Can we uh, go to the recommendations? Members happy to agree to 2.1? and also to receive a further report on the visitor information center. Yeah, okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Doug. Hope you thoroughly enjoyed your first experience of the Prison Gallery Council's EI committee. <laughs> thank you.
Do you members can we turn now to item number six, which is the Flood Risk Management Plan Act 2009, our um, publication of the plan. Can I ask the director if he wishes to add anything to the report before members? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Stephen Herriot has something to add, uh, so I'll pass over to Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Just to, to say that there was an additional Appendix 1E uh, circulated by, by email to members, and that sets out the approval of the plan by Forestry Commission Scotland. That came in late, uh, and if we don't have a copy of that, we can, we can make a hard copy available just now. That would be useful. Receive that email, okay? We've got a copy there, Ronnie. No. Does anybody wish a hard copy to have a look at? Do you want to arrange to pass them around? Give members a couple of minutes to have a look at it if you haven't seen it already. Okay, can I open it up to any questions on the report before us? Chair, uh, you'll recollect, uh, I think, uh, you know, on more than one occasion, you know, after uh, sort of trying to pick up the pieces with Storms, Frank and Desmond, uh, there were comments made in this chamber by myself, among others, that uh, it was essential that the Scottish Government would uh, conduct a radical review of the criteria which would apply uh, for the flood risk flood prevention schemes for small communities uh, such as Newton Stewart, Fern, places like that. Uh, I notice we've still got the same splits of 80% uh, and 20%. This council at a time of extreme financial stringency has still been asked to find 20%. Can I ask, Chair, for the record, uh, I, I appreciate the representations along these lines were made, but for the record, did they bear, uh, did, did they bear any positive results? Not that I'm aware of, Alistair, I have to say, unless officers have got any other information. Certainly no proposals to change the criteria to include the small, small projects. No, I know, I, know that, I know the issues were raised in the meeting with, between the Director and the Minister for Environment at the time. Uh, CEPA had already published a flood risk management strategy, so I would think it would be very difficult for them to, to, to retract on that or to change their approach for the next six years. Um, so CEPA's strategy was published at the end of last year, and we've kind of picked that up as our local flood risk management plan has developed, and that has reflected that the, the funding it was agreed recently at COSLA Leaders, which was 20% funding generally required by local authorities for the large capital schemes uh, and the other 80% coming from uh, the Scottish Government grants. I was aware of that, sir, from perusal of the papers, but the po point I'm making is that, you know, it's a heck of a lot of money uh, for this. I mean, take, you know, and I'll, forgive me, Chair, I'm, I'm not with parochial. Newton Stewart, 7.5 million is the estimated cost of the scheme at this moment in time. Uh, and this council will have to find 1.5 million of that sum. Uh, that's a lot of money uh, to, to, to have to find uh, in relation to our current financial uh, circumstances. And I'm sure that will be replicated at the length and breadth of Scotland, you know, with other, with other priority projects. But uh, um, I'll have to say that uh, just a wee bit disappointed that uh, it would appear, in fact, that the representations that you know, we've made uh, don't appear to have borne fruit. I'll leave it at that, Chair. Thank you. Uh, George. Thank, thanks, Chair. I'm pleased to see in page 74 that Kersfairn hasn't fallen off the radar. I was wondering if somebody could give us a sort of timeline on, on what's actually happening there, because I would hate to, to be going into next winter and maybe the same thing happening again before anything's actually done. We should maybe actually be, be lobbying our new MSP, Mr. Carson, uh, who's also a council member, one of the council members for Kersfairn to certainly lobby the Scottish Parliament about this. But I was just wondering, where are we? Because, you know, I would hate, I would hate something to happen again next winter. We've had it two winters in a row. Just, yes, on, on Kersfairn, we, we, we deal with that in the local flood risk management plan. 
and there has been added in. It's been additional to uh, the kind of requirements to come out of the initial work identifying the potentially vulnerable areas. And that's been in response to the, the kind of three floods in the two years, the three significant floods uh, in the two years. And the report points out that we will, uh, we will look at uh, developing options that, that, that might identify a feasible scheme. And that if we do identify a feasible scheme, a uh, previous committee decision was that we would go back and lobby Scottish Government to support uh, the inclusion of that scheme within their funding package. But, you know, the success of that, we, we need to find out at the time. So we, Brian, Brian will maybe just cover some of the details. So we're doing a bit more work in terms of updating the flood risk assessment uh, and looking at options that might that might protect the community. But I, it's it, it's not a quick time scale. There isn't there isn't a kind of quick fix. And, and Brian can maybe talk a bit about that. Yeah, I'll be able to give you a sort of brief up, update. We were getting further work done, uh, survey work done, which are hoping to be completed this uh, week to, to update the existing flood risk assessment, which uh, which was uh, done, and that's just to re re refine any model and just to make sure that you know it, it meets what uh, what is clear and strong. Frank, uh, from this uh, survey works, we'll, we'll get sort of a, a new re a report published. And we'll be getting the uh, tender doc uh, uh, documents out to take it to the next stage. As as Stephen says, uh, if we get someone that uh, that has got a positive cost, you know, benefit sitting there, uh, then we can lobby for money. We did look at sort of any short term quick win options, but uh, really there's not a lot that we could do. So we did look at putting the uh, barriers up the sort of main road to sort of help out in their sort of low sort of Sort of events, but uh, that made matters worse than the bigger ones. So obviously, as uh, our principal, we couldn't do what sort of we did. Okay, members, any other questions? And Dennis, and then Jack. Yeah, thanks, dear. So it's a question. It's something I think that might be missing, and it's something I get asked about regularly, and I've heard other members on about, and that is the build-up of gravel in our rivers, helping to cause major flooding issues. Now, experts tell us that's impossible, but we have seen the evidence of this. And it's one that comes up every now and again, because in the past, your builder used to go down and just take a bit of gravel out of the river and used to sort it, but not anymore. And with, with, the, with the, the flooding that comes from forestry now because of the drainage, we now have flash floods instead of just a steady buildup, which means the great big gravel deposits end up in certain places. And as I say, it's a, it's a constant issue we try and get it sorted, but people won't let it shift that gravel, which to me is an absolute nonsense, and I would like to see a proper discussion and something included in the plan about how we deal with gravel, especially when it, when it starts to build up on some rivers by five, six, seven, eight, nine feet high on one corner, which may not cause flooding, but it will cause damage to walls and things on the other side of the river and change the course of the river. So there's, there's a big issue there, and I think it's across many rivers in Dumfries and Galloway, especially with the forestry. And I really think it's something we need to be able to talk to people about, pick up and get, get as part of a plan for action, instead of having to go every now and again and argue with them for a year or two years to try and fix it. Yeah, I'll just quickly cover that as well. Uh, I think we've uh, met sheep in the past, and uh, they've sort of would uh, would support any sort of sediment uh, management if if it would be a sort of a significant sort of improvement in flood uh, flood risk. To sort of prove that, obviously, it all it all comes down to more uh, modelling works, which can be quite you know quite sort of expensive. But we have asked somebody to give us a sort of uh, a sort of project brief on sort of estimated cost and uh, how long that these uh, modelling works would uh, take. So obviously we could feedback a uh, uh, sort of feature to uh, to yourself what sort of cost these was. Obviously, if you if you are sort of taking out sort of gra uh, gravels, that would then be an ongoing pros uh, process, which would be sort of amount of cost year after year. Yeah, it's not even about taking stuff out. What what happens is. The gravel on that has been moved to one particular corner because the river has changed. It almost needs the gravel just to be flattened out across the riverbed. I mean, I, I've got instances where there's water pipes exposed, the sewage wipes are exposed, and there's electric cables exposed because the river is now pushing the stuff into a corner. And I say, I, I know I've heard it from the, the Galloway end as well, the flash flood and the gravel build-up. And it really is something we need to take account of and look at very carefully. It is, go it is ongoing, but it is ongoing because the rivers have changed. And what they're now doing, as I say, it's, it's 
fighting all this sediment down, all the small stones down, and quickly building up these banks. And another part of the river has been scored out, so the channel is deepening, deepening, deepening all the time. And if we have um, supplies running across that river, they're then placed in danger. And I could end up in a situation where I have half a town with, with no electric, can't use the sewage work, et cetera, et cetera. And it is seriously dangerous, and I know it's happening right across this region, not just in my area. Well, I think it's something that we're going to be looking at sort of specifically in the sort of Langham area. So obviously, if we get any sort of positive, positive feedback, we'll feed it back. Sorry, just come back to yourself on that, Jim. Keep the committee uh, updated on the discussion of the SEPA. Uh, I've got Jack and then Ronnie. Thank you. Um, but just a wee follow-up with Dennis. We've been asking for dredging for long enough, but I don't think we'll ever likely to get it. It's worked down south, but it's not acceptable up here for some reason or other. But my point uh, today is that I think, like the rest of us that are based in this area, for the number of emails uh, about the public engagement, and I know it's going further, the public engagement part, uh, I think one, one of the things that we should ask is that any final design solutions should be the outcome of a successful community engagement exercise and be able to display a community consensus, consensus of approval for that final design. What are you actually talking about, Jack? It's for the, all, the, all the flood protection screams right across, no, screams. Not, just, not just the, the sands come. I think, you know, yeah, community community engagement is, is an important part of any flood protection scheme. And certainly, in, you know, schemes we've taken forward in the likes of the White Sands and Stranraer in the, in the past, that there was, you know, a fair amount of community involvement and engagement. Uh, on the, the White Sands scheme, which is, is probably our most, obviously our most developed scheme at the moment, uh, I would see that continued, in, you know, information to those directly affected is important as the detailed design develops, as well as telling, telling people about how the scheme is, is evolving and what exactly we're going to get on the ground that's, that's been approved by committee. Um, Newton Stewart, uh, we're take, taking the scheme forward there. We have a, a flood action group, uh, and I, I can see over time we will work more and more closely with that flood action group as we kind of, uh, you know, kind of conduit main interface into the, the community and, and the community council uh, in terms of the, we've, we've had sessions with them in the past just kind of briefing them and the kind of outline proposals for that scheme. Uh, and I think that, it, you know, there is a realisation that, that there's a need to keep the communities informed and, uh, you know, we're developing solutions that, that the communities can get on side with. I think it's an important point. I think that as the detailed designs for schemes do, do become um, clearer, um, they are obviously um, published and, and people are able to, to, to view those schemes in detail because I think it helps deal with some of the uh, astonishing misinformation that, that's being uh, bandied around, particularly around the White Sands scheme. Uh, in which no, no two accusations seem to be the same week in, week out. And I think actually by publishing the detail of the scheme, showing the public exactly what's being proposed rather than what other people claim is being proposed, which is inaccurate, um, I think that helps deal with a lot of this issue. So I'm looking forward to seeing the final detailed design around the White Sands, and I'm sure as we move forward, other schemes like Langham and Newton Stewart as well, when those detailed schemes um, and the designs are actually published, then the public can get a, a balanced look at um, what's being proposed rather than what um, people might selectively wish to publish in the local newspaper. Jack? Just come back in briefly on that one, Colin. It's the, we're having complaints just now about the, the drainage. I believe the sewage works uh, is a separate scheme that's going to be needing to be done. Well, given the fact you're a member of the committee that agreed the scheme, Jack, you're aware that the work in the sewage works um, is actually part of the scheme that was agreed by the taken forward is also part of the scheme that went to Miss Daly, the committee, for consultation as well. So it's a significant part. In fact, the detailed portions are in the report that came to the committee. Alistair. Thanks, Chair. If I may, I'd just like to get back to Stephen's reference to, you know, to the situation of Newton Stewart. As far as I'm concerned, Chair, the, the, the Council have acquitted themselves tremendously well in their public engagement process in Newton Stewart, uh, Flood Action Group, and, and sort of in, in interacting with the local community. But there's an old cliche, Chair, to the effect that you'll never please, you'll never please all of the people all of the time. Because the one fact of the matter is, I had a, I'll put it politely, I had a robust exchange of views 
where they can stick into the weekend on the basis that, you know, in his assessment, the council have basically done next to nothing, and more importantly, they haven't put it out into the public domain just exactly what they've been doing and what the way forward has been. Uh, I'm afraid I wasn't prepared, you know, to tolerate that and accept it. But it, it, it only goes to show to you that no matter how, how, how well you perform, and, and let me repeat, I think in this, circuit, in this instance, the council performed extremely well in a new short context. Uh, as I say, uh, there are those out there, you know, who, who are not prepared to recognise that and accept that they have a locus and a responsibility uh, to play as well, and particularly looking after their own property. Okay, sorry, Ronnie. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. Uh, Provision Gaul is not unique in this sense. I mean, if you, if you look across the board at Cumbria, they're doing a huge piece of work looking at mitigation of water, you know, how, how they're doing a big piece of work, how the water gets into the river and what causes it then to flood. So maybe there's some learn <coughs> learning we could get from them, because they're, they're, if you watch the news, it's quite regularly on uh, they're doing that piece of work. One of the interesting things that's come out so far is bridges themselves cause a problem, you know, but we've heard. The other th point I wanted to raise was is the Environment Agency in England got a different role than TIPA because the first thing they did when the villages in Cumbria were flooded was dredge all the rivers or, or ferns or whatever streams because they saw the, the, the build-up of the stones. Not that, that was flash flooding, but we've heard examples from others about flash flooding and the stones. Now, the first thing they did was put JCBs in there and dredge them. You, know, you saw it on the telly, you know, putting sandbags and getting it out there to get the, the depth so that water could get away. So there seems to be a, a different plan in England than there is in Scotland from that point of view. So the, there's a thing that we're, we're not sitting in isolation. We could learn from Cumbria because they, well, they're ahead of us in that sense, looking at the mitigation of water, how it comes off the hills and such. So uh, I'm just wondering if the officers would, would be talking to their counterparts in, in Cumbria to see, you know, maybe reinvent the wheel, as it were. I know they're in regular discussions with counterparts off the border, like Stephen. Um, is it Brian? Sorry, Brian. Brian. Uh, part, uh, part of this uh, process was uh, a cross-borders uh, group, mate, and it was uh, ourselves, SIPA, and uh, Cumbria, our city councils and that. So we sort of covered all, all these uh, measures. Uh, I can't really speak for what the Environment Agency do, but uh, you know I've watched the same sort of shows as the as you and uh, water courses that got dredged, and then in, uh, after four or five weeks, uh, when you got more poles coming down, it had to be re dredged. And, and there was a uh, people's views well that uh, dredging, dredging made it worse else, elsewhere. So, you know, it's got to be it's got to be seen that you're not doing what's going to make it worse else, elsewhere, and it's not an, on, an ongoing burden. And Archie. Thanks very much. I can just echo what Alistair said about what happened in Newton Shear and what the council actually did there. I mean, you look to what, what DG First did with the, the partner agencies in there, and there was a lot of good work actually covered over that particular period. But coming back to Newton Shear as well, I think working in partnership with other bodies as well, that there, there's the issue about the, the footbridge that was with the army. And, and one of the things I did is, in my other role was actually talk to the army and see if there's a potential for raising that bridge with a joint council MOD. Type thing, and I don't know if Alistair, if you've got any update on on that particular one. I'll just ask uh, Brian if you update information. Thanks. Yeah, I think they're looking to 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 raise that bridge by sort of one uh, one point two meters. Uh, I know that we've had sort of dealings with the army, as you say. Uh, it's currently at the design stage, uh, so you know, I don't know if there's any involvement. That Army could, uh, could, uh, could give, uh, but obviously that that was met. But it has intention to raise it 1.2 meters. Jeff, could you just ask us to be kept updated on that because obviously they make work with with officers and uh, the army liaison officer for for Dumfries and Galloway is actually going to be changing very shortly. I'll just make sure that he's up to date as well. I think the main issue. Uh, for the army was uh, it, it was the local, as you say, it was the local uh, contact that, that we had the meeting with. Uh, but I think he very quickly under, uh, understood the situation, and, and I think it's more for the engineers because it is quite a task, and, and I think that's what we're waiting for in terms of collaboration. Okay, members can return to the recommendations. Members, last to note two point one. Happy to note.
2.2, and happy to agree 2.3. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, members, can we turn now to item number seven um, on Harbour Management and Operation Port Marine Safety Code update? Or duty holder, can I ask the director um, if he wishes to add anything to the report before members? Uh, thank you, Chair, and I think Stephen has uh, an update on the report. Okay. Just, I've actually got three updates, just uh, keep, keep you in the picture a bit. As, as duty holder, since the report was published, uh, we've had an approach from the MCA and they want to carry out an audit on the Port Marine Safety Code on the 29th of June, and that will be at the Kirkubri Harbour plus one of our Marcus Harbours. And Keith, as Regional Harbour Master, will be involved with the MCA in that process. Uh, Keith's also been approached by the Northern Lighthouse Board, and they would like to do an audit again, again against the, the Port Marine Safety Code requirement, and that will focus specifically uh, on navigation aids. And the third point that I would just wanted to update the committee on was the nominations for the subcommittee. Uh, and it's mentioned in the, in the papers in terms of development of the subcommittee uh, as previously agreed uh, by, 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 by this committee and, and sanctioned by full council. They were looking for seven nominations uh, for the subcommittee. And as of this morning, uh, governance is advising us that we have four uh, members nominated for that subcommittee. And they are Ian Carruthers, Ronnie Ogilvie, Craig Peacock, and George Prince. And we're to wait. Uh, we're awaiting the, the other three nominations to come by. Okay, thanks for that update, Stephen. Can I open it up now to members? Any questions on the report before us, Jim? Yeah, three point one nine. It says representatives of the council, Port of Cairn, Ryan, and Loch Ryan Port, planned a meeting on the second of June to agree a way forward. We'll be subject to a verbal update. Any update on that? Yep, if I can just come back on that point as well. Yep, it's an update. So, meeting was held at the start of June with uh, Keno and with Stenner, and really, it's uh, it's been one of a number of meetings we've had over the past couple of years. Particularly, uh, we'd had a previous meeting with Keno and Stenner and the uh, the MCA, and we'd had a, another meeting with Keno and Stenner and Transport Scotland, just to move forward and to try and get a consensus view on how we should be managing uh, the harbour area within within the, the kind of total Loch Ryan area. So, at the meeting of the second of June. Uh, there was a kind of consensus between the parties that we should still push the MCA uh, for uh, much of the lock being treated as open sea, and that it wouldn't. Uh, it is not. It's not particularly in the interest of any of the parties that one uh, authority would be the harbour master for the whole of uh, Lock Ryan. So we have a bit of work to do. We recommissioned a navigation risk assessment, and it identified that uh, the southern part of the, of the lock didn't necessarily need to be covered as a harbour authority, but that really the Council should focus on the recommendation that was that the Council should focus on the East Pier and the West Pier area and the marina and the kind of development of that marina area and that P&O and Stena should focus on their areas that are carved out associated with the ports uh, at Cairn Ryan. So out of that navigation risk assessment, we have a bit of work to do to further develop the memorandum of understanding we have with P&O and Stena and deal with some of the, the kind of documentation that looks at the kind of interaction, particularly with the, the, the ferry vessels at the top of the loch, uh, and that we will uh, develop that and go back to the MCA and continue to push the case that we believe uh, that we should be looking at three separate harbour authorities and not one harbour authority for the whole of the loch. Uh, and uh, once we've done that, if we can convince the MCA, we'll be able to publish an order uh, that Transport Scotland would then be able to make for us, but they won't handle a uh, situation where the MC are not in agreement with that process. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good luck with trying to convince the MCA of anything, but uh, we're not just going to have to try and convince them. The MEIB made recommendations, etc., etc., because of an incident in Loch Ryan some years ago that said literally that the council are the harbour authority for the whole of the law. Uh, what are you going to do to try and convince them that in future they're wrong? We did, when we met with the MCA, uh, we also met with the MEIB, and we discussed this through with them, uh, and we pointed out that we, we believed, and that is the, navigation, the recent navigation risk assessment has also pointed out that 
the situation is quite different from 10 plus years ago when the two incidents took place around about 2004, I think it was, uh, that the MEIB reports dealt with. And the recommendations arising out of that were when we had fast craft operating in the loch. Uh, and the case that we uh, have been making with the MEIB and will continue to make is that we're now looking at slower vessels and the, the, the nature of the incidents were to do with wash potentially from fast craft and that that isn't the case anymore in terms of the level of risk at the top of the law. Here I've got Alistair then, Patrick. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I don't wish to appear or to come across as being negative, but paragraph 3.9, the last sentence, it talks about in general council insurance would cover members undertaking their role as duty holders. Uh, it's the phrase, uh, Chair, in general, that concerns me somewhat. Can we perhaps have uh, some more clarification on that? But, uh... Somebody wish to clarify the phrase in general for Alistair and actually for the rest of us for that one? I think we probably will go back and ask uh, for more clarification on t in terms of the terminology. We can bring that back to the, the, the subcommittee and, the, and the, the duty holder that's formed. A, I think in terms of council insurance, I, th I think what it's saying is that really only if there was a negligent act uh, by members or, or the, uh, you know, by the duty holder or the committee that there might be an issue in terms of insurance coverage. But I can certainly ask for more uh, clarity on that to uh, give some peace of mind. Alistair? Uh, I'd be grateful, uh, sir, if, uh, if, if Stephen uh, could, could provide that clarification. Because, I mean, quite frankly, Chair, as I say, I don't want to come across as being negative, but that's an extremely serious point. Uh, it applies to, uh, our, to all uh, outside organisations, obviously, in which uh, we, we put members, uh, we appoint members to serve, but uh, particularly in, a, in, a, in an organisation of this type, uh, I think it's only right and proper, in fact, that we should get as much clarification as we reasonably can. Thank you, Chair. Alistair, that will be taken forward. Patsy? Yes, just a, a couple of things. Um, I'm looking at the table two, which is the Pukubi Harbour actions being progressed by the Peace and Gallery Council. And there's, a, there's one point is to consider forming a Pukubi Harbour user group, which I think would be a very good idea. But I'm just wondering where the marina comes in. Sort of thing. Is it part of the harbour user group, even though it's not? If I could answer that one, we've had one meeting so far of the Kukubi Safety Forum, it's called, which includes um, representatives from the um, fishing vessel owners, fishing skippers, and the sailing club as well. And we've had, say, one meeting on that. Sorry, just to come back. The sailing club is not quite the same as people who have boats at the marina who are just sailing, if you like, or just using that as a berthing place in some of the so it's not they don't park their boats, but I mean whatever they do with them. Um, so the marinas there used to be a marina users group in Kukubi and I don't know that that's functioning anymore, but I just wondered if it could be part of your Kukubi Harbour. Um, yes, I, I will t I'll take that on board and make sure that all berth holders are included in, in the safety group. So the majority are covered anyway by the actual sailing club. That forms the majority of the berth holders there, but I'll take that. The other thing I just noticed, Chair, if you don't mind, is about the oil spill contingency plan. I noticed that Kukubri has one, and but it says at the beginning of that column in, on page 103 that all five harbours have plans in place, but at the bottom it says that... Um, that there are remaining oil spill contingency plans to be produced. Are they just sitting on a shelf somewhere re ready to go, or have they actually... I mean, that's a slight contradiction. You say you've got more ready, but actually you've only produced one. I think there are, there are a number of historic oil spill contingency plans for the other harbours as well, uh, and it's, there's, a, there's a refresh and a rewrite and update process that's required. accurate um, there aren't five prepared as yet um, can I just update that the I have just seen the draft oil pollution plans for all five harbors uh, Ian 
I was just on the point about the, the, the subcommittee. Are, are you expecting the remaining nominations today, or uh, what's the time scale for that? Yeah, I know there's a training oh. event on the 27th, so groups will have to move quickly. Stephen, have you, did we give a closing date? I'd, I'd check and see if there was a closing date. We certainly we were looking, we were trying to look for the date. We were wanting to inform this committee meeting uh, of, of, of the members. Um, and we've, we've pushed our colleagues in governance who could send out a reminder to the political groups that are still to report. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a point of clarity, actually, uh, with the 3.10, um, which says the establishment of the, the subcommittee is duty holder. Um, would that, therefore, mean that the, the members of that subcommittee committee would be the sole duty holders and remove that responsibility from the members of this being the parent committee? Yeah, yeah it, that's exactly what would happen and it was it came out of the, the, the audit uh, uh, undertaken by the designated person uh, and I think the feeling there was in the audit against the Port Marine Safety Code that a more discreet group of members would be appropriate to, to manage that, that, that uh, role. Also. Can, can I, can I uh, as uh, Chair, nominate Councillor Vitt on behalf of uh, our group who has to place on this committee? A lot of our groups, but if, if that's the case, then so, yeah. Dennis? Likewise, could I nominate Councillor Fassie Gilroy? Thank you. I think that's us. Is that a school now? Group still to... Uh, chase that group up, but that takes us up just one more. So, so ensure that governments chase up the final group to get their nomination. So that's uh, Ian and Dennis. Okay, any other questions from members? No? Okay, can we turn to the recommendations? Members happy to note 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, 2.8, 2.9, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20, 2.21, 2.22, 2.23, 2.24, 2.25, 2.26, 2.27, 2.28, 2.29, 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33, 2.34, 2.35, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 2.39, 2.40, 2.41, 2.42, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.47, 2.48, 2.49, 2.50, 2.51, 2.52, 2.53, 2.54, 2.55, 2.56, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.60, 2.61, 2.62, 2.63, 2.64, 2.65, 2.66, 2.67, 2.68, 2.69, 2.70, 2.71, 2.72, 2.73, 2.74, 2.75, 2.76, 2.77, 2.78, 2.79, 2.80, 2.81, 2.82, 2.83, 2.84, 2.85, 2.86, 2.87, 2.88, 2.89, 2.90, 2.91, 2.92, 2.93, 2.94, 2.95, 2.96, 2.97, 2.98, 2.99, 2.100, 2.101, 2.102, 2.103, 2.104, 2.105, 2.106, 2.107, 2.108, 2.109, 2.110, 2.111, 2.112, 2.113, 2.114, 2.115, 2.116, 2.117, 2.118, 2.119, 2.120, 2.121, 2.122, 2.123, 2.124, 2.125, 2.126, 2.127, 2.128, 2.129, 2.130, 2.131, 2.132, 2.133, 2.134, 2.135, 2.136, 2.137, 2.138, 2.139, 2.140, 2.141, 2.142, 2.143, 2.144, 2.145, 2.146, 2.147, 2.148, 2.149, 2.150, 2.151, 2.152, 2.153, 2.154, 2.155, 2.156, 2.157, 2.158, 2.159, 2.160, 2.171, 2.172, 2.173, 2.174, 2.175, 2.176, 2.177, 2.178, 2.178, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 2.179, 
challenges facing um, the south of Scotland. And, and I think this strategy is important to give a focus on the type of work um, that we want to take forward uh, along with the partners in, in, in the Scottish borders and, and how we measure success um, in delivering that, 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 that strategy. No. Yeah, I mean, if, if this had been Highlands, there would have been a proper enterprise zone set up here and, and things would have been happening. And I, I know when the South of Scotland Alliance was set up, it was really not welcomed at that stage by government. And I think there needs to be more pressure applied because the, the facts speak for themselves. We are the lowest in Scotland, therefore we should be the ones getting the serious help. And I really think we should be looking for a full enterprise zone or something across. There are things happening in the borders that never seem to creep over the border. So some, somehow we need to get this message even further across, and I think the government needs to really step up the plate on this and really start to invest and help the south of Scotland. We're trying to get that, that, that real link extended through Langham, aren't you, Dennis? But I think it's a, it's a valid point. I think that there is a big contrast between the Highlands and Islands Agency, uh, Enterprise Agency and, and uh, Scottish Enterprise and the fact that a business in the Highlands and Islands could get funding that if it was based in the south of Scotland, it wouldn't be entitled to that particular funding. There is, to be fair, the government a review at the moment on... Um, all the agencies, Scottish Enterprise Skills Development in Scotland, are carrying out a review, uh, and, and we'll certainly be putting pressure on um, to influence that review um, to make sure that we do get, um, I think, parity with the Highlands and Islands. I think it's only fair. Um, they've, they've done very well over the years in terms of their, their lobbying. We need to up our game as well to achieve that. Jim? Yeah, Chair, uh, you'll not get an argument for me regarding wanting parity with Highlands and Islands. Uh, I... I uh, also hear what uh, Dennis is saying uh, regarding the contents of the plan and the fact that we have got nothing left for the textile industry in uh, the Fries and Galloway. Uh, that uh, is really unfortunate. However, uh, the worker SOSA uh, also includes the regeneration of Stranra. Last time I looked, that wasn't anywhere near the borders. Uh, I, I, I would actually... Uh, second Archie and actually congratulate SOSA and your officers and not to embarrass you, you yourself and the progress that SOSA has made in the last two to three years and yeah. getting the, the government ministers etc etc to actually listen to you and I would second Archie and going along with the recommendations. Thanks very much indeed Jim. Okay members can we turn to the recommendations then? I think it's fair to say we've considered the uh, strategy. Are members happy to agree the strategy before us? Yeah. Okay. okay, members, can we turn now to item number nine, the Stranraer Town Centre Regeneration Project? I ask the director, was there anything to add to the report before members? Uh, nothing to add to the report at this cha stage, Chair. Thank you. Okay, can we open it up to members' questions? Roberta. Thank you, Chair. I'm very happy to accept this report. Um, it's superb for the town to see this money coming in and to enable buildings to be regenerated and refurbished. Um, the question I want to ask is about the training, education and awareness programme providing, providing training. Is this training going to be in the local college in Stranraer? Anybody? Yes, it will be. We'll be linking up with the colleges and the main training providers. Archie? Just, just on the same question here, I, I take it it's not just colleges but local employers as well that will see the opportunities of apprenticeships and that going forward that way? Yeah, absolutely right. Any other members? Okay, can we turn to the recommendations? Members happy to note 2.1 and to agree 2.2, 2.3 and uh, 2.4. Excellent. And we look forward to the, uh, the work getting underway and more progress in the regeneration of Stranraer. Thanks very much. Okay, members, can we turn now to item number 10? On enterprise and services and the commercial plan. Can I ask the director if he wishes to add anything to the report before members? Uh, no, nothing to add to the report uh, in particular, uh, Chair, but, but, but just to say 
uh, that this report uh, was aired at our seminar when we discussed the EEI business plan. Uh, it has also uh, been in front of the British, the Business Transformation Board steering group, uh, and it was also heard uh, and draft at the DG First Management Committee. So uh, members have had some sight of it before, but it's here today uh, for its approval by the EEI committee, and it is a key uh, move and a key uh, stage uh, in taking the new reshaping forward. Uh, so Ronnie will be delighted to, to take any questions regarding uh, the, the plan. Thank you. Okay, can I open up to questions, Alistair? Thanks very much indeed, Chair. As far as I'm concerned, th this is a, a, a laudable and a, a piece of work, aspirational, obviously. Question would be, Chair, that uh, when uh, we're putting the flesh in the bones, for want of a better term, uh, uh, what will the, the, the role of the elected members be in that process? Uh, but equally importantly, arguably perhaps more so, sir, uh, can we have the assurance that the, the trade unions will be, will be consulted to the appropriate degree in the, the appropriate fashion? Uh, through you, Chair, I'm very much seeking through the uh, the subgroup, uh, our subcommittee, uh, and through this very committee to have member involvement uh, to ensure that members are fully aware of the development, the activities, and the proposals that are being developed in relation to the enterprising DG in supporting the economy and bringing business uh, back into the council. So it's very much um, looking for their help and support throughout that process and having good di dialogue and a very open and transparent approach uh, to that. And certainly in relation to the trade unions, uh, that has to be a, a key and pivotal part that we need their help and support uh, to engage and to ensure that both they and the, the workforce that they represent are fully aware of what they're endeavouring to do. Grateful for the response, Chair. Thank you. Um, we've got Ronnie and then Ian. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. Um, it's one of um, the, the got put money up front to get some money back. We take it. Uh, just to be terribly parochial, there was a, a plan put forward to knock down an old depot that we owned, we couldn't sell, redevelop it, and then get some income from that. So it's, there's a capital cost there, which is not quite well, um, explicit in the report. And time scales, you know, um, it's okay having the plan, but when can we move along and see how it's going to happen? And I'll just give that one as an example, but, you know, there's a list of things that we could look at and with the cost and time scales against it, it'd be good. Uh, through you again, Chair, uh, very much one of the key elements of having uh, the enterprising DG subcommittee to give us that help and support and direction and allowing us uh, from that to seek capital funding that would allow these projects to, to move forward. There has been this uh, period of vacuum between what has been before under the old uh, uh, DG First, now as we move into this new, this new model, it gives us the ability to, uh, to bring forward these projects to ensure that they are robust, that the members fully support, and then we can seek that funding uh, appropriately through the council as well. You mentioned the subgroup. Has the subgroup been established? And, and if so, there's a minutes produced that can be shared with everybody. It'll go to the next meeting of full council to establish what the membership will be, whether it'll be 11 or 7. And then after that, obviously, it'll meet soon after once membership's agreed yet. It goes to the next meeting of full council on the 28th of June, I think. Um, Ian Dick and then Archer. Thanks, Chair. Can I just ask what processes and procedures have been placed to ensure that members of, are, are aware if we are commissioning um, work from the private sector, uh, who's bidding for it, what the value of the contracts are, who's successful, and, and so on, so that we're, we're uh, uh, certain that we're getting value for money? I'm assuming that will be the role of the subcommittee. Yeah, the, the, the role of the subcommittee will be to, to hold the head of service to account for the delivery of the plan. So all, all details associated with the delivery of that plan uh, w w will be seen and will be considered and will be scrutinised by the subcommittee. Okay, Archie, then Patsy. Th thanks, Chair. I mean, this, this was well and truly discussed at the, the final uh, DG First um, committee. 
and it was it was well challenged by the, the vice chair of E and I and, and and other members within that particular thing. I see this is a great step forward and actually try to bring some uh, funding back to the council to improve the opportunities that we would have in there. I also see it as a, a great opportunity for the small to medium enterprises within Dumfries and Galloway actually being part of these, hopefully tender contracts that we go forward in and then try to raise that that we discussed in the previous thing, the, the, the minimum wage, the living wage, all of that sort of things, which, which actually improve the opportunities for small to medium enterprises actually getting involved in larger contracts rather than having to bring these bigger uh, companies like Lane Rourke and all that into the area. We can actually do that ourselves with a, with a, a fair wind. Patsy, and then Craig. Uh, thank you. I'm just looking at 3.7, and there's just two phrases in there that um, I, I think this, I mean, I'm, I hope this all works well, and I'm, I'm really supportive of it. Um, but, you know, the, the phrase to, to generate a surplus and to develop a market are both in there, which I have no problem with, but I just wonder how you think you're going to do it. Or is that something that's going to come from this new subcommittee, or have you got ideas already in plan? For you again, Chair. Um, yes, there are ideas that the, the, the team has collective, collectively been looking at of what business is out there, what work is currently, um, dare I say, disappearing out with Dumfries and Galloway, that we, the, the, the monetary side goes from Dumfries and Galloway, where we could look to try and bring that back in and develop these new markets. Um, as a prime example, uh, I, would, I would quote the, uh, the car valeting. For a long time, that has been... Uh, process that has been done in Dumfries and Galloway by, by an organisation that wasn't based within this authority that has came back into the council and is allowing uh, not only the money to be inwardly invested uh, locally, but it is also giving opportunities to small companies that previously could not participate in those uh, contracts because they were framed up in such a way that it precluded them taking on the whole contract. So we're supporting uh, the small organisation and allowing them to get in to, to deliver some of this business as well. <laughs> Come in. Uh, okay, and uh, finally I've got Craig. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I've, I've always believed that um, the Council should be able to generate its own income from commercial enterprises and, uh, and I'm pleased now that legislation is, is moving so that we're, we're allowed to do that now and, and uh, this business plan sets it out for us. It is very ambitious, uh, I agree with that, uh, considering the, the slow rate of the economy across the UK over the past sort of 68 years. But uh, as Archie said, I made my challenges to, the, to all that during the DG First Management Committee, so I'll not go back into all that. Um, but it was just to say that, yes, it, it is an ambitious plan. I do look forward to it um, coming across and I'm happy to approve it. Okay, members, can we go to the recommendations? Are members happy to approve 2.1 and to note 2.2? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, members, item number 11. Uh, any other business? I don't have any other business. Um, deemed urgent. Um, so can we turn to uh, number 12, which is the um, adoption of the resolution to exclude the public from the meeting? <laughs> 